We've got Joe Ward next. How are you feeling, Joe? Uh, I'm getting a bit dry. Okay. Joe spoke to us about his training in America, flying mosquitoes, and flying canberras. And here we are, another man who's flown canberras. And that's where he left off in September last year, speaking about canberras. He'd like to carry on with a little bit about canberras and then move into the 10,000 hours of chopper flying he achieved both in the RAF and in Western Australia. It's over to Joe Ward, strapped in and ready to go. Where's me? Just so there the aircraft he trained in. That's him with the mosquito. That's the... What was he training for? <laughs> <laughs> Development. That's and that's the one that's a, that's where he's off. taking off. Just that following with the engine. Yep. Right, good. Can you hear me in the back? Fasten your seat bolts because it gets a bit bumpy. When I rejoined the Air Force in 1950, being a current flying tractor, I had moved on quite quickly, and I joined the squadron, 58 squadron. They were a photographic reconnaissance squadron, high altitude boys. Um, and I was there for two tours. For five years, I was a spy in the sky. For the first three years, we flew the Havana Mosquitoes, the Mark 34 for day and 35 for night photography. Then we went across to the camera for the next two years. In 1950, constantly flying now at 36,000 feet or around about, we kept running into very strong winds. We told the map people about it, they said, hold on, that's the thing. But in 1953, they came forward and said, you hard flyers had better watch out. There's two phenomena up there. Um, that you could run into. One is clear, one is uh, jet streams, which are quite safe. And the second one is clear air turbulence, which is dangerous. The jet streams are nothing more than rivers of air flying, flowing around our world, balanced in the pressures. They run between 30 and 40,000 feet. Uh, they're about 5,000 feet thick and about 5 mile wide. They generally run from west to east because of coriolis of the earth. And the speed is about 150 to 200 knots. If they're going your way, hop into them. If they're going to get out of them. If you remember last time I told you, I used one going down to North Africa. And I had a ground speed of 660 knots. Clear air tablets. It's a different kind of fish to be avoided. What we knew about it was it's a pool of air. 5,000 foot thick, roughly between 35 and 45,000 feet, where you get rapid changes of temperature and violent up and down drafts. Dangerous, avoid it. Now, I had um, been down to Morocco to do a survey. Job for it, so I dropped into Gibraltar for the night. In the morning, we climbed out of Gibraltar and we headed in. We flew around Spain diplomatically. I leveled off at 40,000 feet, while I go all the way up. I'm above all civilian traffic. If anybody comes nose and round up, I can quickly go at 50,000 feet anyhow. So on South East Cape of Spain, I turn left and wide turn to line up with Marseille. City of Marseille. The buried lines went under my left wing. The city of Valencia was down there, where they held the big yacht races. Up there was Barcelona, where they held the 1992 Olympics. Over there were the Pyrenees, and in there were the Alps. <coughs> Across the Bessane, at 40,000 feet, I'm trundling along about 500 miles an hour. What weather there is is down there. I have a blue dome of the sky all to myself. When suddenly, as I hit brick wall. I almost lost control of the aircraft, I had a fight on my hands. I'd hit clear air turbulence. 
Now the camera is in there. The camera weighs in just over 55,000 pounds. Yet we were picked up and strung down like a leaf. Vibration was so much you couldn't read an instrument. It was so a giant pair of hands to grab the tip tank and slip me like a waffle board. The great matter up here says, go with the coach. So I hauled off the power, off the airbrake, and threw it vertical. It was a rough rise, but it was 46 and 47,000 feet, we ran into clear air. I pushed the nose forward and left it just up to 48,000 feet. Meanwhile, I took a check of the situation. Yes, I still have a tip tank. Yes, the control still worked. Intons were set them down. And the adrenaline was back in the gallop. <laughs> Everything seemed to set down to normal, so I put the airbags to bed and to bed. I spooled up the engines and went back to the cruise. Head up to home. When everything was settled down, I said to my navigator, I'm so sorry about that rough ride. That's clear air turbine. What do you think of it? Not what you see. All my instruments were on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> when I got my wings, the Air Force wings, first pair, I, I have a second pair of the United, United States Navy wings. I have a third pair of wings, three zero arms. I got a fourth pair of wings when I got my commercial license on fixed aviation, six wing aviation. And when I converted that to rotary wing, I got a fifth pair of wings. <laughs> but having got the first wings, I went for an interview in the Air Force to see if I was the right stuff for commission. Suddenly I wasn't. I was a farmer's boy. I was too outspoken in those days. And I did all the wrong things. I drank pints of beer into the halves. I read the sun in the daily mirror and sent the telegraph. I went out with loose women. I was even known to fart in the bath. <laughs> My documents in the Air Force state he was made of good NCO. <laughs> so in 1950, when I went to join the Air Force again, I said, how about the commission? I got them the documents and said, if it is here, you'll be a good NCO. That's it. In that case, that's how I will be. <laughs> so when my navigator and I got settled in, I said to him, you and I are going to be one of the top crews on this airfield. The two squadrons there. We're going to be the top ten. It turned out we were in the top five. In 1953, Emmons brought in a... Um, the first thing you joined the squadron, you were known as training. You were built up your hours and the photography. If you passed it after that year, you then went into combat. Combat now allows you to fly anywhere, uh, as far as the Iron Curtain. What I think of it. Because the Russians playing up as interesting. Now, after the second year, if you reach the required amount of hours, plus the uh, standard photography, you then went into what we call select. The select group was allowed to go anywhere in the world, but that was for the last six months. Well, being in my second tour, I automatically filled all the uh, qualifications. And of the six squadrons on the airfield, there were only four select crew. There were two officer crews, mid crew, and myself and my navigator, two sergeants. When we flew around the world with the camera, which was duck egg blue, and we landed all these strange airfields, people flocked around, they hadn't seen anything as gorgeous as that. And they quite expected it had to be something so sophisticated, and it had to be a wing commander who flew that. <laughs> well, when we stepped out, it was quite amazing looking at special on their faces, sort of thing. We had the right amount of scraps, but we were in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> you heard the saying, life hangs by a thread. I gave it a note to this guy. I'm climbing for a cruising up to the 48,000 feet. I've just gone through 30,000 feet when something goes hang. That is too wrong. Nothing wrong with the aircraft. I felt all right. It's me. I felt like death warmed up. Something was terribly wrong. I spoke to the navigator. 
Ja, das ist fein. Und jetzt haben wir einen Kampf von Bösen, die wir gleich gewachsen sind. So, ein Check Machine, ein Full Tank zu den Deliveren. Alles korrekt gehockt hat. Confirmation, I need a confirmation. I took off my gloves, I looked at my nails, they were blue as the sky above me. First stage of hypoxia, get down fast. By this time, I'm topping 35,000 feet. I'm having 20,000 feet quick. So I rolled on his back and pulled into his eye, and I told him I never get, never get hang on. So I think, see? At the speed I was doing, it wouldn't take long to cover a full mile. You see, and 15,000 are inked out the dive, and I took off and off to the mat, and it started deep breathing. Things returned to normal. I said, never get this at home. So he gave me a course, and uh, he said, the bank will call him up and told him I was inbound. When we walked away from the aircraft in this person, we ran into the chief engineer. And he said to me, you back early. Ain't wrong. So I told him what happened. I don't have a look see, he said. So we debriefed, we were having a quiet cigarette. Then the engineer turned up and said, put out your hand. He placed it in an ring. I said, what's that for? He said, the tap was missing from your office. You wouldn't get any at all, he said. We're all going to waste in the airport. He said, it won't happen again. Off he went. The right, you didn't hang by a friend, you hold by an over. <laughs> I got a big job ahead of me today, a big survey job. <laughs> so I've got every gall gallon of coal uh, put in. I've got six vertical cameras and a bleak camera. The boys say, you'll never get off. I said, I'll give it a while. I got kids to take off, took them off the other runway. Local birds hopped over the side. I reached the flying speed, lifted off. I stepped the brakes, stopped the wheels rumbling in the wheel wheels when, when they were retracted. Looked down, selected only the is up. Looked up and realized I was in trouble. There were two birds in my front last computer control, control heading for me. <laughs> As one went past my window, I struck the high pressure clock on the port engine. Port engine exploded. I stamped on the right pedal for direction control. I had a frog back and starboard end from full power, whose joints effect would turn me on my back. And that would be an embarrassment on the feet. At the same time, I lowered the nose to show what speed I got. Control tower saw that and they tore me up and they said, What's wrong? I said, Wait one. I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> when the engine exploded by the navigator, they said, What the hell was that? I said, We've got no crow in the, in the engine. I'm all right. I said, No. That's a strap strike. We're going in on our belly. Now we put the ejectors. But this thing was still flying, I wasn't going to give up just yet. Now, multi-engine drivers know that when they take off, they win about two speeds. One is takeoff speed, and somewhere down the track, depending on the design of the aircraft, is safety speed. The bit in between is known as the no man's hand. And when you're in no man's hand, all man's gravity has a great habit of grabbing you, especially the ground. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was in no one's land, but I wasn't ready for my gravity to set. So I opened up the starboard engine to lay the thing on the ground. By the use of the throttle, locked the rope rudder, and a few words of encouragement, I didn't lay on the ground at all. I got it out of no man's land above safety speed. Once above safety speed, of course, my immediate problems were over. Accelerated. I looked at the starboard engine because when I opened it up to do this, all the gauges went all over the place. But at safety speed, I looked at the engine; it settled down. I thought, okay, I've got one bird in that engine. What happened to the other one? It's supposed to be in that engine. I didn't know it at the time, but it was still with me. So I accelerated through the knots, lifted the air up to a thousand feet, and settled down because. <clears throat> I still wasn't out of the woods. You see, I had two tick tanks full of gas. And I wasn't, I couldn't jettison them, and I wasn't allowed to land them full. Which meant I got fly around to burn sufficient to transfer. When I, early on when the afternoon was not told to wait one, that treated the course of winter mother flying. 
because he's racing from Tonga Tower because one of his birds is in Tonga. So I haven't settled down there. I see, I don't. It wasn't going to be difficult, you see, the consumption of the two engines was 750 gallons an hour. It's the same to 75, 45,000 feet, it drops to 200 an hour. So it's it, it, it wasn't going to take long. But I thought I'd better call up from Tonga Tower to uh, put them in picture. And I did. And the winter man said, what's wrong? I said, you've got a bird in the engine. He said, how do you know? I said, it's not cooking. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't think that was funny at all. He asked a lot more questions. He said, come in and land. I said, I can't. I've got full tip tanks. You'll have my permission. Now, whether that made safe or not, I don't know. <laughs> but the whole year got back to the airfield. I turned down winds. And the 165 knots, I loaded the other times. And then, as the other trains went down, the speed on was a far off the clock. My second bird was impaled on a piece of the just about. <laughs> <laughs> With a reduction of speed, it was closed over the intake. It wasn't my intake. <laughs> then I was overloaded on one end, and then the other was <laughs> So I called up the navigator and said, We're still in ship. He took us up, I said, I lost my ASI. He must have looked down, he said, it's going to hell, what are you going to do? I said, it takes you up there to reject. No, he said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm a bloody thing. He said, we've done over a million miles together, what's the thing more? I'm staying. For the second time at morning, I told him, get strapped up. So, here I was, yeah, back to basics. It was flying by the seat of the pants. I landed the aircraft by feel, had one shot in the locker, and it was topical. There we are. So that's one of the There's that. <coughs> Good. This is now friendly engine. Wow. One rolls always aim at the engine. If it didn't hit, if cartridge started housing here, Ricky said back, hit this swirl, that, that's, that's the, supposed to be a full step. Hit the swirl veins. Which Richard said back, and as you can see here, every rotor blade and set blade is considered gone. In a fraction of a second, it, 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 the, the engine was working with revolving at 8,200 revs a minute. In a fraction of a second, it was dead. The stuff was stopping, it knocked all the bleed valves off the top of the engine, it broke the engine in half, and turned it 7.5 degrees in its mouth. Well, that was one thing. Anyway, um, we are at the end of our time on five years up. We have to split up and navigate myself. <coughs> um, he went off and got his commission. He was put on ground duties. He wasn't happy about that. <coughs> he finally got back into flying. He finally wound up as a master navigator on a Vulcan V bomber. Me, I couldn't go up any higher. I didn't want to go down, so I stepped sideways. <laughs> And the new thing, final thing on the market in those days was a helicopter. I converted on this little fellow, it was a dragonfly. fly. They're not difficult to fly, they're just tricky. In a fixed wing aircraft, they put, put a wing on and an engine, and you race in the runway, lift, and off you go. Quite simple. This thing hadn't got any wings. So they put them up here and rotate them. Well, once you do that, you start running into trouble. You start getting a lot of gyroscopic effect up here. Newton's third law comes into play immediately. Every action has an equal opposite. So if you've got a lot of fun one way, it doesn't bother in. The food's a lot of good other So they put out a boom, put a tail rope on it, to stop it happening. That's all right. All you have to do is to mix them all together. You have three controls. You have a side clip between, in your right hand between your legs. You have two pills which operate in all sense. Plus, in your left hand is a stick called collective. There's a fossil at the end. When you move that up and down, you alter the pitch on the blades. When you alter the pitch on the blades, you increase the pitch. You have to increase the number of the engine to take the load. If you decrease the pitch from here, you have to decrease the engine, otherwise it runs away. It's all a matter of balance. I have a problem. It's like trying to sit onto a big ball. You keep falling off it. <laughs> but they're not fun. That was fun. You fly a fixed wing for one hour, you've flown it for ten minutes. You fly that for an hour, you've flown it for sixty minutes. 
<laughs> Having completed my 50 hours here, I was then sent to Kuala Lumpur, Malaya, where the Air Force, uh, where there was a bit of scrap going on. They had three squadrons of aircraft there, two F, two, one ten, one ten squadron, one five, five squadron. They flew, the F-55. As an F-8, always got some action. Okay. And I was moved down to one nine four squadron, which flew the Bristol Sycamore, and our job was cutting for evacuation. We carried in anything and everything, from newborn to the deceased, burns victim, trash victim, aircraft things. You think of even, even just a plain case of malaria, we picked it up and brought it into hospital. Uh, my 31st casualty was a fellow called Corporal Offen, an army fellow. They were pushing the road through the jungle. And the tree fell off and crushed him on the bulldozer. Now I got the call to go and pick him up, and I was on the starting box to go. But the patrol so I said, No, wait for the doctor. That's not a good sign, because when you take a doctor, things are a bit rougher at the other end. So I think it is. Doctor appeared, and off we went. And I set off, it's about 35 minute haul down the jungle. It's a 4,000 foot mountain here, and the camp was the other side. So I set off on the station route. Which was done. Control tower came up and said, This is an emergency, emergency, it's going direct. Straight on the jungle. So over the top of 4,000 feet, through to the other side, landed in the camp box. The doctor went across the casualty, I had a look at him. I don't know how he could be alive, it's a mangled mess. He'd be worse than some of the roads that I've seen. But the doctor said he was alive. So we put him in the helicopter, and the stressors used to go through the helicopter away. So we put him on board, and we took off the shortest distance to a straight line. And I wound up, and off up the mountain. The doctor said, not above 500 feet, it's full of morphine, you're killing. I said, what about the mountain? He said, find your way around it. There's no good turning right, and the high jungle, you have to be the left. So off I went to the left, down the valley, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw the doctor through his window. I thought, you mad fool. There's a hundred and water bag outside, we have to be the first place we can get. I got an open valley, I said, how's he doing? We're going to lose him. I said, why? He's really cold. Do you want me to shut my window? He said, yes. So I shut my window. Things were nice and warming up a bit now. Okay. Now I'm getting down the mountain, I get another open valley, and I said, how's he doing? And he said, we're going to lose him. I said, is it still cold? He said, yeah. I said, do you want cabin heat? Have you got any? I said, yes. Yeah. I put on cabin heat. If it was cold and hot before, forget it. The temperature rose dramatically. It was like the sauna had gone mad. The jungle green suddenly went black and sweat. It was difficult to hold the controls with had so much moisture. It didn't drip off it, it ran off in the river. But the point was, we were on the last gun straight. I crawled up ahead and they were waiting for me. As soon as I landed, the stretcher the was taken out on the side and off to a hospital. The doctor followed. I got out to help. I got back inside. It was bloody cold out there, in comparison. <laughs> there was a hundred degrees out there, and about two hundred inside. Anyway, I got back inside, opened the door, turned off the heater. The doctor came back about five minutes, hopped on board, and we flew back to base. And I said, were we in time? He said, you did your best. Sort of thing, you know. I went to a hospital several times, but it was three months past before I delivered another casualty, a 56th to be honest, when I remembered that the long sport was often. And I saw the board master and I said, I brought this guy there about three months ago, what happened to him? Shuffled a bit of paper, then he looked at me and grinned. He said, he walked out of here yesterday, he flew into England from today. I thought, magnificent. I'd help save a life. I walked out there ten foot tall myself, you know, wonderful thing. In October, we went to Hong Kong. See, they celebrate in Hong Kong rather seriously. October 1st is the Communist Revolution, October 12th is the Nazi Revolution. 
Not in 56, we had all deaths. So we saw by helicopters. You couldn't buy them, no one had them. So we went up there, two of us. We were loaded with guns and tear gas. Fortunately, the sight of a helicopter boring down on them was sufficient to disturb this little bit of crowd that we never flew uh, uh, in, in anger. Back in the lab, mid this was 57, mid December, my tour is up, I'll be home for Christmas. In the time I'd been there, I'd completed over a thousand hours flying. I carried out 250 operations, but I rescued 121 personnel. To me, I was just doing a job. Hear me at times, but nevertheless a job. But people in high places thought otherwise. Because very shortly after that, my name was gazetted in the London Times. And a few months later, long after that, I got a letter from Buckingham Palace. I had a front up. Her Majesty's Queen was greatly pleased to award me the distinguished flying medal. So that was that was that. What happened to you? By that was in 57, 58 of course. My time is up with the Air Force, and so I go to school, I get the rotary wing, pack on my license, and I head off down to no. That one. I head off to Nigeria from the F-55. First on the top is we only contract the CLBP, looking for oil and gas in the swamp and the jungle. This day I'm on the one with pontoons. I'm taking two surveyors out to the delta, river mouth of the Niger. It's mud and water everywhere. We find a patch of mud and I land on it. And the two men get out and disappear. And I'm standing on the pontoon looking around thinking, what a god awful place. It's not a bird, not an insect, it's not a butterfly, it's nothing but water and mud and mangrove. And so the other mangrove walked his native towards me. Black as that space. Never heard the word clothes, I suppose, in time. Mm -hmm. They came within about three yards of the helicopter. I was about to step off and take hands, but someone told me to stay put. So he stood there and he looked me straight in the eye. He slowly his eyes went all the way down to my feet and came back up again. He looked me straight in the eye and then he grinned at me. He had pointed teeth. I was looking at a large cannibal. <laughs> the spark in his eyes. <laughs> Fortunately, my two surveyors turned up and I'm a lot of men. It's close call. <laughs> In the higher country, of course, we dire. All the villagers are making on round ball soccer. So they have football fields. It would make it very easy for us to have a top <coughs> But when we did go to these places, either to see the head man or survey or the look of it, um, as I came into land, the first man who appeared in the clear, it was a beautiful man, the witch doctor. He was covered in rank from head to foot, generally a little bit blue. He raced around the helicopter, and over here he got out his mat, threw down, he got his mat down, <coughs> and he threw the bones and stones on there, and sniped him with the work. We took the other no, no, side, the boys went off to do the job. But I got out and said, well, we've we'll got to talk to him. And he was, when the natives turned up, he would tell them, he made it powerful. Big silver bird, I bring it down to make it better. We did a job, we hopped in, pressed the button and walked around. He then told them to see, I made it powerful, I made it fit again, it's the only one that's <laughs> back into the So that was, that was in 1960, they had independence, and we flew couldn't tell the sun of a the more presented to her. There's a lot more story there for having the time. After five years in Nigeria, I left there and we came to Australia in 1954. Join Amsterdam and we flew to the Gulf 47. Most of the French, 
Well, I used to fly my old bus from his home to work. Mr. Anton himself at times. But we were working, we did all sorts of charter work. I was terribly let down. I believe there was a Father Christmas. One. One Christmas in Melbourne, I delivered 28 Father Christmases. <laughs> 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 then we got a job out in the bus straight. We, fr we flew that in the second half of it. Here. And in the bus straight was the Glow R3. Now, when you go offshore, the water is shallow, you use the jacket roots. This can be moved up and down. So it floats in like that, you see, with these sticking up there. Then it comes along and it pops them down, so to say, and lifts the body up there. Now this is the wet atlas, which was burnt, if you remember, up here, out here. There was a dirt up there, but gone. But that's used in shallow water. When you get a little bit out of it, you then go to Glow More 3, this little fellow. Now he's only 5,000 tonner. It's known as um, wild catting. Sergeant boys in those days did all their work, sort of thing, and they came forward and they said, that's the most likely spot to do. It'd be either gas or, or water. They couldn't tell us oh, which it was. We had to go down. So this was used to put the down to find out what it was. If it was oil or gas, then the bigger boys would have done. But guess what? It was one of conception in 11,000 feet. Um, we'll stay here for a minute. And we see the bus straight. The weather was building up a bit. Now, it is anchors, four anchors here and four anchors there. You see? So it goes up and down with the sea. And every now and then it goes out of face of the sea. It hesitates, it can't make up as long to do. At that point, you are just about here and you're pumping on. Then it turns out you've done the you see it hits the front, down you go, and so you sit there riding up and down. Now, we were doing a cruise change on this. The weather was not blowing from here, it was blowing from here, from the south, from the Tasman. So it made it very difficult. We came along the side. And you pump it and you put it in first in your head because you didn't put it in your tail. See? We've done two trips out, we've done in pairs for safety. We've done two trips out, and um, I said, when the people before, I said to the young lad with me, hand token, can you, uh, if move, moving around a bit, I said, well, you're not going to back anymore. So I said, all right. So I called them up and cancelled it for a regular work. But I said, if you have an accident, give me a call. I said, what I'm going to do. Sure enough, about three hours later, when the weather getting worse, they called up and they said, oh, I got smacked ten. And I said, all right, what's the boat doing? He said, it's pitching ten and rolling ten. Ten is what they mean. So off I went. It's a leaping now with man thing. So I turned along the side edge, the wind's blowing in here. I turned along here. And as it hesitates, I'm on. I plonk it on. As soon as I put it on here, the sea hits the front here, up goes that, and down we go. <laughs> I'm sitting on here, and I'm suddenly looking up there. The sea is 10 feet above me. And I thought, you're going to get wet. <laughs> well, that's the sea passed underneath, you see. The bow went down, and I was there. And I'm looking around, thinking, what a magnificent view. We're going to end with that straight. <laughs> up goes about, down goes the town, but by the time, unfortunately, my passengers on board, and so I lift up, I continued going and took him to hospital. <laughs> now, later on, when I joined Bristol's, their maximum pitch was five degrees, measuring midships. One degree here is seven feet movement there. You went out five, you can make that 35 feet. So you were treating 35 feet. Okay. When you, um, when these boys found stuff in winter production, then of course we moved to the big boys. Said to the big, we're trying to do this. Right there. I mean, it's right there. You see, it's easier. These the big boys move in. That's a glue on three. One hole and gone. These boys will do 24 holes in that one position. Okay. The sea can be running through there 20. 
foot C. Uh, the body here is a stable on this floor. The only trick on landing here is the windsock can be standing out straight because it marvels. But as you get close to it, it suddenly produces a vacuum and you plumb it out the deck. You've got to be very quick to recover, otherwise you wrap it up. Yeah? So, anyway, that's what happens with the oil reef. Okay. That's the one we use in the second. Okay? And that's a big one I use on Bow Island. This, that carries about seven, this carries 14. I don't know how to do it, sorry. You can see I've seen most of WA. These are on the coast, the blue ones, of the lighthouse. We visited those that were not accessible by land. It's that here. All those around here are places that I've worked, so I think, surveys, for instance. All around the Mercer's that we did survey here. In here, we did all the um, stream samples of the Mountain River. I helped to build the Mountain Newman Railway. Port of the Mountain Newman. What was interesting about that, that some way gathered the fixed, fixed uh, figures, and it turned out that for every completed mile of railway, we consumed 345 half tons of beer. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be lubricated, don't mind me. I helped build the old river dam, and up here I set up the Drysdale National Park. I've been to a spot over here, and I don't think, I think I'm probably the first man who ever, white man who ever stood there. Because you can't get in by road, well there are no roads, you can't go in by four wheel drive either. You can't go in by horseback because the gorges are too big. You can't get in from the sea because the cliffs are too high. You totally wouldn't go in by the helicopter. And when I think back now, what an idiot I was, it was a man and then switched off, and my life hung on that little tiny battery in the room. Never used to think about that, you know. Press the button, used to go. Sometimes it is, you know, because we were working in the Hamilton Iron Group, and we left Mount Newman at seven that morning. We went, and half past seven we were there. And one of the surveyors came and said, we've left a tripod over there, would you pick it up? I said, yeah. I went and had a press the button, flat as a tank. Mm -hmm. Empty, had it. What do we do now? Well, we had all the food and what have you. Then I said to Les, we'll walk out. Which is what we did. We walked out, we came round the hill, and in the distance we could see Mount Newman. But halfway to Mount Newman was the Rose Ridge, where they were working. And I thought, if we can get Rose Ridge, we can get some more. So we set off. Not too bad, about 20 yards ahead. We took all the food and water with us. And as we were coming down the hill, of course, we could see Mount Newman, no problem. But once we were on the flats, that was a bit difficult. I didn't take the compass because the wind was blowing and it was in my left ear. When he used to stray, you know, went back away. Back away. <laughs> so we came, we stopped every hour, we had refreshment, went to eat, cigarette, off we went and on. Half past three, we climbed the ridge, we looked down, boom, bridge, right on the button. Eight hours they took us through that, the feet were like that. Nevertheless. So I've seen most of the way. Now, what else are we going to say about that? What's the, what was the other one? This one. The last seven years I worked for Hampton Island on the concert. I always wanted to be a train driver, but here some dumb as Washington. In the book. Mm -hmm. They used to live all from Tom Floyd's Pavilion to docks. From the docks, it was processed and put up all these ships. And off we went to Japan. Now, these photos were taken with the marine department today. day. Uh, this one's interesting because he came in the story this one. We followed him on the way in. He parked 12 miles out, we followed him. Then he came to park and didn't see. As they put it in here, how they stirred the bottom. But the interesting thing is here, you see, how they opened the hatches for the oil. But when they load that, they put oil in the first hatch. All in number 10 hats, number 2, number 9, number 3, number 7. They leave 8 empty. They pull all the rest, and the skipper with the pumps of mine joins his fellow here, and then they slide uh, on the cargo. And anything that's left goes into hatch 8. 
and off it goes. Now, this ship, this was 82, I think, flies uh, regularly back and forth from Zampia to Japan. Back here, from here. Well, in 83, um, even though it was unusual, and off it went. It was about 100 miles out, but it was an accident on board. And then it suffered an evacuation. I got the job. Because there wasn't room for the big helicopter on it. No one could on. So I caught him up. He was 100 miles out. He was going flat sack. 11 knots he was doing. So I came alongside. I slipped in. I don't know that hat. Now one has to remember when it lands on the you don't relax because you're on a solid base. You're doing 11 knots, so you've got to land and fly at the same time. Otherwise, you'd be peeled off. Yeah. So I landed on there, picked up the casualty, lifted it up, stood sideways, and brought him back. It turned out, soon after I retired, he was my 200th casualty. And I think, round about that, how many of time? Oh, I'm in that coast then. I said, pack up. I said, pack up. Before I leave, though, I can tell you a joke. <laughs> it's one of my favourites I've known for years. I still suck at it. It's a good old stage yeah, joke. Two old farmers were leaning on the gate, discussing the dairy herd. One of them suffered terribly from flatulence. And while they were talking, he relieved himself rather noisily. The other one, without turning here, turned to his him, You know, Bertie, that would have started with a bit more choke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <she was> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>